So welcome everybody. It's truly a pleasure to have you here as part of uh, this Jack Ride um, event. Tonight, what we're gonna do is speak a bit about um, a few things about how to prepare for the ride. And we're gonna start with some, uh, some questions that are usually of top of mind for a lot of, uh, of riders, both new as well as experienced around bike maintenance. So there's a few tricks when you're out on the road uh, the number one issue that most people run into when you're on the road is a flat tire. And so for some of us, we have a lot of experience taking off our, our wheels. Some of us don't. And oftentimes the hardest wheel to get off is the rear wheel. So there's a little trick that I want to share with you uh, that should you be in the unfortunate situation of having a, a flat in your rear tire, um, what you want to do is shift your rear gears into the smallest sprocket. So your sprockets are basically the name for the gears on the back and put it in, put the front chain ring into the small chain ring. And what that does is it creates the most amount of slack on your chain to make it easy to get your wheel off. So step one is always shift your gears, the front gear, into the small ring and the back gear into the small ring. And then you want to pop your wheel off. And then when you put it back in, it'll also be a lot easier to slide back in with that. The other tip that some people won't know about is if you're riding a road bike, your road bike will have the ability to open and close the brake. So depending on what type of gear or brakes you have, it'll be a little bit of a different mechanism. Most of our customers are riding with Shimano brakes and on the top of the brake caliper, if it's a rim brake, there's a little lever that you can um, pull open and closed. It's usually right around here on your brake and it just flips up. If that lever is in the up position, that's gonna keep your brake open. So be careful uh, if you're out riding and you see that open, it's less safe and you wanna make sure that's closed while you're riding. So that is kind of the two biggest tips for when you're out on the road. Um, the other thing is what you can do to prepare ahead of time. And one of the conversations I have with a lot of our customers at Kind Human when they come into our shop is they'll say, well, I don't know how to change a flat. And so I'm just gonna depend on somebody else to help me. When you're doing a ride such as like the Jack ride, um, especially in years where we're allowed to ride with lots of people. Um, but even this year, you're probably gonna be in a situation that if you have a flat tire, there, hopefully there's somebody who knows how to fix that. And my number one recommendation for that scenario is have your own gear. Um, so that way, all you need is somebody's assistance and you don't have to depend on them for giving you their supplies. So what, what you want to take with you um, and the best place to store this is in a saddle bag which goes on the back of your seat is one a spare tube two tire levers three is something to inflate the tube um, so there's two primary types of inflators out there one is called co2 which is a, a little cartridge you probably have one in my drawer here. Um, so that's a tube. Looks like all my CO2s are not, thought I had some, uh, but a little there, it's a little cartridge about that big. Um, it's super lightweight. And the advantage of that is that you can inflate the tube really, really quickly. The disadvantage of the CO2 option is that once you run out of the CO2, a cartridge is usually good for one, one tube. You run out, you're out. And then you could be stuck if you have more than one flat. So the other option is a pump. Um, and you can get little hand pumps that can either stick into a jersey pocket or attach to, to your bike. I personally ride, typically when I'm doing a ride, I'll ride with two CO2 tube um, canisters. Um, which is most of the time enough. 
And um, if I'm doing like a really big ride or if I'm providing support for other riders, then I'll fill my pockets with four or five CO2 canisters to, to be able to help other people. But for yourself, if you're riding with CO2, usually two is a good rule of thumb. The other little thing that's helpful is a pre-glued patch kit. And those are basically tiny little stickers that you can use if you get a cut in your tire. You can stick it onto the inside of the tire. Or if you have more than one flat and you've run out of tubes, you can put one of those patches on, on the tube to, to get you home. So those are kind of our, the big trip tips for dealing with when you're on the road. Um, but now let's talk about like what can you do to to help you for preventive maintenance. So the first trick that we always tell people about is make sure your tires are properly inflated. Um, for a road a road bike, typically you're going to be about a hundred psi. Um, that will be there'll be a psi label on the side of your tire which will give you an indication of what pressure is for that specific tire the reason you want to pump your tires frequently is that on on a road bike your tires are naturally going to lose air um, over time and um, so i pump my tires at least once a week at a minimum and by keeping your tires inflated on a regular basis, it's going to reduce the chance that you're going to have a flat tire. The other thing that happens quite a lot is um, noises on a bike. So the, the most common noise that we find is sometimes you'll hear like a bit of a squeaking noise. And that's usually an indication that your, uh, your chain is, needs some lube added to it. And so you can get lube from any, any bike shop and there are two types of lube. So one is called uh, dry lube. The other type is called uh, wet lube. And the difference between the two is really about the conditions you're riding in. Most of the time we recommend a dry lube. And the reason for that is it goes on clean and it attracts less dirt. So it's easier to keep your your chain clean with dry lube. You can also use dry lube if it's raining. The, the only thing is you're gonna have to clean and reapply after you ride in the rain. A wet lube is more viscous and a thicker lube, and that is more resistant to, to getting washed off if you're riding in a lot of rain. Um, so we usually only recommend like a, a wet lube if, if you're riding in a, a, a lot, a lot of wet weather. Um, or through the winter, that kind of stuff. But for most people, a dry lube is the best option for most of them. Other noises are, are often very, very difficult to um, diagnose for the untrained ear. Um, so for that kind of stuff, I recommend bringing it into your local shop and having a mechanic look at it. Um, but I thought at this time I'd open up uh, for any other questions for uh, that somebody in the audience may have. I see. Um, Looks like Eric has a quick um, question. Yeah, yeah, I, I I have a question. I just got a, a unmuted. Yeah, I was curious about um one of the things mentioned in the meeting notes were like the mindset for a, a long ride like this. Uh, I bike a fair bit, but I've never done like a really long fundraising ride. Like, do you have any advice for that? Like, like around just your thinking going into it. Absolutely. So the the first thing I find helpful is come to the ride with the the mindset that is going to be serve you the best so if you're doing this to have fun come with the mindset that i am coming to have fun and part of that is being aware of that things may go um, different to how you had them planned so if you're for example let's say you're running late getting to the start 
it's going to be okay. You're going to figure out a way to catch up or you find a way to still have fun, even if uh, maybe you miss the friend who you wanted to ride with and they get ahead of you. Um, so be flexible is, is kind of um, a great approach. The, the other thing to be aware of is if you're doing a very long ride and it's a push of your abilities, there are going to be times where you're going to hurt. And it's okay to be in pain and it's okay to have a little bit of discomfort while you're out riding. And so what I, what I often attempt to do is take a look at the situation and find a way that helps me cope. So when I'm doing a ride like a jack ride um, and I, if I get into a situation where I just feel like crap and I'm starting to suffer more than is comfortable, Something that helps me is I start to think about other who I'm riding for. And so in my mind, I'm thinking, okay, there are a lot of people out there who, by me participating, this is helping. And I know they're also going through a struggle. So this is a small way for me to show them that I care about them. So those, that addresses kind of the what happens when things don't go right, but also show up and realize you're doing this for fun, you're doing it for a good cause, and it's going to be okay. And whatever happens, you're gonna figure it out. That's awesome, thank you. Yeah. Linda, do you have, uh, have a question? Well, and just on what Eric was saying, the advantage is this, um, this year and last year is that it's not a big group thing, so there's no, it's not the pressure. I shouldn't say that there's, there wasn't pressure, but it's, it's, there's a lot, a lot, this, it's only you or whoever you want to ride with. So, uh, um, so as a result, we can make it as fun as we want. And I say, if we go in with that attitude, then we make it that because we pick our route. We pick how, how hard we do want to make it. And whatever you do will be beneficial because you've committed, committed to your, um, to the to your sponsors so just enjoy it that's my key thing and uh, um and for me because i'm not a serious rider um i i love i love to ride but i don't do the distances or anything so um but that's where i wanted to make sure that i knew the basics of the maintenance and so uh, um i just wanted to review again for for my the bare minimum because I'm again I'm not looking I'm probably um, well this year we're doing fifty and 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 I'm I shouldn't say this I'm not cheating I'm not cheating by admitting this but um, I due to health reasons I have an electric bike so I have it makes it a little bit easier um, to um, to to have that because I know I have the backup but at the same point um, it's you still have to bike it and you still have to um, use your pedal power. So uh, for someone like myself, uh, um, who just wants to have fun and, and do the distance, um, the key thing then, Gavin, that you're saying we need to have is a spare. spare and um, do I, I guess I have to have a CO2 cartridge to fill that spare. Yeah, so um, there's two devices for inflating the tire. One is a CO2 cartridge with the inflator. Um, the other is a, a pump that is, is compact. What is the um, easiest and or cheapest option? So it's a bit of a double-edged sword. So typically CO2, is, if you're not flatting all the time, is going to be the actual CO2 inflator is less expensive. Um, however, if you're flatting a lot, then you do have to buy cartridges and those usually cost two to $4 um, kind of in that price range uh, per cartridge. The, as far as ease of use, the benefit of CO2 is it takes zero effort to, um, like you don't have to pump with this tiny little pump in order to get your tires up to pressure. You, attach it and it just one thing to be aware of with co2 cartridges is that they get very 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 cold um, so a lot of the good ones are sold with a little um, inflator sleeve 
which will help to um, protect your hands from the cold. If you don't have that, just be aware because um, you don't want to get frostbite or damage your fingers. Um, the, the other benefit to the pump is you don't run out of air. So I kind of equate it to, to scuba diving. A CO2 cartridge is like your air canister. Um, it allows you scuba diving. You can go deeper. You can do a lot more things. There are advantages to it. Whereas with a snorkel, you can just stay by the surface. And as long as, as, long as the snorkel works, then you always have air. Right, right. Oh, okay. So um, obviously the best thing to do is to go to my uh, um, bike store that I bought um, the bike at and get, uh, um, ask for this obviously things that are specific to my bike. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, um, and so basically have the spare, have the um, hand pump or cartridge. You mentioned tire levers. What are those? So a tire, let me see if I have one down here. Um, I don't have any in my bag of tricks here. Um, basically, it's a it's a little lever that you can get at any bike shop, which you put into the rim. Um, and yeah. that's what helps you get the, the tire off. Um, oh, I see. I see Nicholas showing something there. Yeah. Right. Oh, okay. Thanks, Nicholas. So that'll yeah. help okay. you get to get the tire off, but it can also help you to get the tire back on if you're not able to do it with your hands. One right. thing to be to remember when you're putting the tire back onto the rim is you've got to be careful that the tire lever doesn't touch the tube and pinch That's the true. tube on when you're because you can puncture the tire putting it back on. I've done that many times. Um, it's a very common thing, um, but it's something to be aware of when when especially when you're out on the road. Right. Okay. Thank you. And then the other, um, yeah, the lube is just something that um, you can have for any time, I guess, just to have at home. Uh, yes. um, so that, okay, good. No, I just want to, uh, to clarify, um, because normally on the ride, we're with a group of people, um, but because we're doing it on our own, um, it's probably worthwhile for everybody to have this type of stuff. Yes. Yeah. And even if you're doing a ride with um, in a big group, um, it's good to have the gear. So that way you, when you're stopped, you can ask somebody for help and you're not having to take their gear. You're not relying on them to, to provide you with gear, especially with CO2s. Um, if I'm out for a ride and I've only taken two with me and somebody's flatted before me, I'm going to give them my CO2, but now that's putting me at risk. Um, right. So part of being a good citizen is being prepared you with your own gear. Yeah. Sharing, but also being prepared um, so you're not putting somebody else uh, in a hardship. No, very good point. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Nicholas, did you have a, a question that you wanted to bring up or were you just showing us the, uh, the lever? You're, uh, you're muted, uh, so I can't hear. I see your mouth, but I can't hear you. Your, your, are, you, are your headphones connected? Uh, does that work now? Perfect. Yeah, my AirPods are broken, so that's why <laughs> I can't speak to them. Um, also, if someone said hi to Vanessa, sorry, I'm logged into her account, so she might have ignored you and I might have changed it to my name. I think someone did say hi to her before, so sorry about that. She wasn't ignoring you. Um, just a quick question about a spare tube. Um, I have a, a uh, it's 700. It's my first time doing, I just got into biking this year, actually. So I'm starting just to learn uh, a fair bit about it. And I have a, uh, the tube is a 700 by 38 C. And I was wondering if it matters if it's, um, I know the 700 has to be specific, but if it's 32 or 35, will, will that fit? Or does it have to be exactly 700 by 38 C that I buy as a spare tube? So ideally you, you want to get the same, size tube to match your tire. Um, 
if, if you'll humor me a bit, I'll give you a bit of a longer explanation to this. Um, so yep. um, as a rule of thumb, a, especially in an emergency, a smaller tube will inflate big enough uh, if it's the same diameter. Um, so for example, if I only have a 32, um, 32C 32 tube and I have a 38C tire, um, then that'll work. It's, it's less than ideal, but it'll work. Um, so I thought it would be helpful to take a step back and explain to people what these numbers actually numbers mean. are. Yeah. yeah. So on your, when you have a tire, there's going to be a marking on the side of the tire, which is going to give you the diameter as well as the width of the, the tire. So 700 C is the diameter. And that, so that is what is typically for a road wheel. A hybrid bike is oftentimes a 700 C. Uh, gravel bikes are 700 C. Um, some gravel bikes will be 650 B. Odds are, if you have a 650B gravel bike, you're going to know that because um, it's, um, it's just less common than the 700. On mountain bikes, they're typically measured in imperial, metri uh, imperial uh, so inches. So the diameter will be 26 inch is a lot of older mountain bikes. 650B, which is the same as 27.5, is a very common standard today. And then there's what are called 29ers, which is a 29 in. So those are all the diameters of, of your, your tire. The width of your tire um, on, on a road bike or gravel bike is typically going to be uh, measured in C, which is millimeters. Um, so those like typical road tires today are 25 wide. Um, a lot of people are now riding 28 C's on road bikes. If you have a gravel bike, it's most likely going to be around uh, 20 or sorry, um, 30, typically 35, 38, sometimes 40 or 50. Uh, and then a lot of hybrids uh, tires are going to be a 32 C. Uh, so that's the width. When buying the tube, you want it, so you want to match the the diameter. So, for example, 700C, and then it's going to give you a range for the width. So it'll usually say like 700C by 23 to 28. Um, uh, so that means that that tube will fit a tire between 23 and 28C in width. So you're going to see the range on the tube. You just want to make sure your tires in that range. Again, if you can only get something that is slightly smaller, then it's going to be okay. A lot of times, like you see, like for road bikes, they'll have super lightweight tubes, and sometimes all they're doing is using something that was actually made for a smaller tube and calling it super lightweight so that you can use it for for a bigger one. Um, so the other thing about buying a tube is the valve length. So standard valve lengths are, um, if you have a pretty standard aluminum rim that came with your bike, then that is typically uh, 42 uh, millimeters in length for the valve stem. So your valve stem is, is this here. So this is a 42 um, length valve stem. We sell ones, uh, kind human, uh, most common ones, especially for carbon wheels are gonna be 60 millimeters or even 80 millimeters. And that's when you have like my bike, I have some deeper dish uh, rims. So the width of my rim is deeper. For that rim there, I use, um, I can get away with a 42, but a 60 is usually ideal. So those are the types of things that you wanna look for when, when buying tubes. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. Perfect. Thanks so much. Anybody else have any uh, any questions? Um, I had a, a quick question. It's like ultra basic. Um, I'm a very novice rider myself. I'm actually borrowing a hybrid bike of a friend of mine's to do um, jack ride with. So do you sort of have any tips 
or like the top three things to kind of check in terms of positioning, like whether that's like where your seat height should be or handlebars to just make the ride as comfortable as possible? <laughs> Absolutely. So the one that is going to be easiest for you to control, especially if, um, if you've borrowed a bike um, or you don't have the skills to do uh, the adjustments yourself, is going to be saddle height. Um, so for, for saddle height, the easy way to find, uh, like the quick and dirty way to do it is if you, you get on your bike and put your heel on the pedal, and put your pedal down at six o'clock. And when your heel is on the pedal at six o'clock, your legs should be straight and your hips should be level. So if you're leaning over to like one side, because um, your legs too look like it's too, uh, too far of a distance, so you're leaning over in order to, to reach the pedal, um, that's a sign that your your saddle's too high. So legs straight, hips flat, and your heel on when your heels on the pedal at six o'clock. For handlebars, um, this is something you you want to make sure you get adjusted by a mechanic or yourself if you have the skills to do it. I I highly advise against um, changing the handlebar height um, without the skills because if you're if that can loosen your headset so your headset is uh this piece in here which keeps everything um secure if that gets loose you can you can damage your frame so as an aside you can notice that's loose if you feel like a knocking um coming from this part of the bike it often feels very similar to when your if your tire or so your wheel um, is not secure that feeling is very similar between here and a very loose headset. Um, so going back to fitting, um, one of the things you can do if you've got a road bike and an easy adjustment is to tilt the handlebars further back. So if you, you can loosen, there's some bolts in here. These get tightened to uh, five Newton meters on most bikes. Um, which is just a measure based on a torque wrench. If you have um, carbon bars, you got to be very, very careful about this because you, if you, if it's too tight, what happens is you can crush the bar, which can break the bar, which would be very, very dangerous when riding. If these bolts are too loose, then um, your handlebar can slip. So with that said, um, be very, very cautious about this adjustment. Um, but if you loosen these, what you can do is rotate the bars up towards you. So these shifters come towards you. That will make the bike feel smaller. If the bike feels too small for you and you want to make the bike feel bigger, then you can very slightly push this, push the bar forward so the shifters get a little bit further away from you. When you go to tighten these bolts, the key trick is that what happens is, so there's four bolts here. When you tighten the one bolt, what that's gonna do is loosen the other three bolts. So the way we do this is go around in a clockwise direction, tighten the one bolt so that it's snug, go to the next one, make it snug, keep going around. And then when you come back to this first one, it's probably gonna be a little bit looser than you left it. So just keep tightening it and going around until it's all to the right torque spec. The, um, the other thing that there is something else that I, I wanted to bring up on, um, but I've forgotten. So obviously uh, maybe I'll, I'll think about it and come back to it. Um, so those are kind of the, the, the quick things about, uh, okay, now I remember. I knew if I, if I rambled a bit, it'd come back to me. So one of the ways to tell if your handlebar is in the right position is when you're sitting comfortably on the bike you and you look down, this bar here should be in alignment covering your hub of your front wheel completely. If 
the hub is behind or in front of it, then that's a sign that your bike is either too big or too too small, or you need to adjust your fit. As far as positioning on the bike, what you're looking for is a little bit of flex in your arms. Um, you don't if if your arms are locked out, what that's going to do is it's you're too stretched out. Um, even if your bike is fit properly, some people, this is a riding technique issue, is you'll see sometimes people are riding like this, um, elbows locked and shoulders up in your ears. That is going to be uncomfortable and it's going to cause pain in your shoulders. So when you're on your bike, drop your shoulders and have a little bit of bend in your arms because it's your arms that provide suspension. And when you have a little bit of bend, um, you're just naturally going to absorb the vibration as you're riding and keep your shoulders, as I mentioned, down. This is going to cause pain and tension, which, uh, especially over a long ride, you don't want. Great, thank you. I see that Linda has, uh, has her hand raised again. Um since you've actually gone into um, talking technique, uh, um, question for you is with your legs uh, um, technique, uh, um, are your feet supposed to be uh, um, cocked all the time? Are they supposed to be, uh, um, I shouldn't say flex, but um, how, what is the best positioning for, for legs then? Uh, um, because I've done different things and I've sort of going back to um, basically having them them flexed, but um, what is the proper way of doing it? So as you're, when you're going around in the pedal stroke, your heel will probably naturally move. So typically what you're doing is you're coming over the top and you're pushing forward. So I think about this as to make circles, make a square. So what I mean by that is if you think about your, you're moving through the pedal stroke, you're going forward, down, back, and up. And what that'll help you do is create a smooth pedal stroke in the circle. So what's gonna happen is as you're going forward, you're pushing forward. And then as you come down, your heel will drop slightly typically kind of like you don't want to be like if your heels drop like that you're going to generate less power so you're coming you're dropping your heels slightly and then you're pulling back so when you're pulling back think about it as scraping dirt off your shoe and you'll notice that as you come back your heels pulling back up again is that uh, is that a clear explanation yeah like there's like we could all we could all bike but as as you're saying this this optimal way to doing it so that's why i was just curious from your opinion what the optimal way is to um to maximize um to maximize the ride or to yeah. as to make it as efficient as possible i guess is more more the question uh, um so yeah that since you were talking about upper body too because it's amazing how you can notice that you lock your arms and yeah without even realizing it so, so yeah so that the the other thing on being the most efficient rider possible that a lot of riders overlook is strength training um so what you'll find is if you do just a little bit of strength training um as well as stretching or foam rolling which helps with flexibility um that is huge for your your riding so for strength training, um, a little bit of like arm work, biceps and triceps, just gives you a little bit more strength um, to support your upper body. The most important is core work. And so if you think about it, you're sitting on your bike and what you're doing is you're pushing and pulling. In order to push and pull, you need to push against something. So your platform is your core. So when you're pushing and pulling your legs, you're using your core muscles in order to generate that power. So doing a little bit of strength training for your core is going to provide tremendous power 
it's also going to make you more comfortable on the bike. Because a lot of times what happens is our core is weak. So what happens is we start compensating with other muscles. And these other muscles are not designed for what we're making them do. And that's where you start getting pain. Back pain, shoulder pain. So if there's one tip I can tell you that's going to make you a stronger rider, it's a little bit of core exercises. And like five minutes a day will, will do wonders for, for your comfort and your performance. That's perfect. Thank you. You're very welcome. What other questions do you, does everybody have for me tonight? Are there any other areas that I haven't addressed? Um, so uh, something else that a lot of people ask us about is what to eat during a ride. Um, and so eating is both actually the food you're eating, but also hydration. So when Going for a ride, um, you tip, most people have uh, space for two water bottles on their bike. Um, so filling those bottles, taking two with you is, is always um, a good starting point. If you're doing longer rides, um, so let's say you're doing a 100 kilometer ride, it's helpful to think in advance about where can I stop to refill my bottle. When we're doing supported rides, it's great because they're rest stations for us, but when, um, when it, especially during like this year's ride where we're doing our own route, uh, we're not going to, um, not gonna have that support stop. So the easy way is when you're routing your map, think about gas stations, because gas stations usually have bottled water um, where you can stop this year, remember your mask, um, when you're going for a ride so that you can stop into a, go inside to a convenience store. Um, I've been out, I've, last summer, um, I was out on a ride and I did not remember my mask and I couldn't go and, and get more water. Um, so remember your mask. So go to, so plan, plan for the stops. Um, I've also been in situations like where I remember one summer, um, it was a super hot day. It was a long ride and we ran out of water and I knocked on somebody's door um, to ask for water. What I found is obviously you've got to be careful about safety um, and you've got to balance the safety risk given where you are. Um, but in my experience, um, whenever I've knocked on somebody's door, they've always been very, very gracious uh, and helped me and um, um, very dire straits situations. So water, um, fill your water bottles, sip on a regular basis. You're far better off to, to, to sip on a regular basis as opposed to just chugging like a full bottle at once. With hydration, number one tip above everything is be hydrated before you start your ride. Um, so practicing good hydration practices will do wonders because if you're dehydrated when you start your ride, you're, you can't catch up no matter how much you drink on the ride. With that, obviously, you got the issue of having to go to the washroom. Um, so I'm not talking about like hugging a whole bunch of water just before you start, but rather having um, good hydration practices on a daily basis. For food, um, Food is very, very personal and different people like different products. Me personally, I prefer to take um, like as real food as possible. My favorite is um, making myself a, a peanut butter sandwich with usually peanut butter and jam or peanut butter and honey. And my, my favorite is with challah bread. Um, white breads um, are good because if the bread is too dense, it's hard to chew and hard to swallow. The other thing about when you're riding is when you're exercising at a high level, what ends up happening in your body is your body is going to shut off your digestion uh, processes. 
And so it's really hard to digest um, heavy food. And that's why I say white bread or um, why I like hella is it's easy to go down, but it's also easier to digest. If I'm having like a, a thick baguette, that's going to be harder for me to, to digest. Um, other things that I like to eat are um, like nuts and seeds. Um, I'll sprinkle in sea salt. So sea, sea salt is really good for electrolytes and electrolyte replenishment. Table salt is dehydrating, whereas sea salt is hydrating. Um, gummies are like if you're you're just buying like gummies from from wherever. Uh, with with gummies, you want to be careful because if you're having a lot of like bad sugar, that can um, and there's a lot of like bad stuff in the gummies and may not have a good reaction for my like, performance level. Um, and then you can obviously buy products from like bike stores and um, and that which are like bars or gels um, and that kind of stuff. Typically, um, the difference between a bar and a gel, a gel is going to be very, very high in sugar, which is going to be a good quick hit. Um, the other advantage of a gel is a lot of racers like them because if you're going at a very high level and you don't have time to stop, then you can get a gel down while you're still on the bike. Whereas if you're like going at race pace um, or you're trying to keep up with the group, it's going to be hard to, um, to eat a bar and get it down safely and enjoyably while you're going at a high pace. As far as like all these different options, when I'm doing a long ride, I will personally take um, a collection of different types of foods. So I'll have my sandwich, I'll have my gels, I'll have, so I have like stuff that I can stop and eat um, for a longer part of the ride. But then I'll also have my quick hits for um, like if I'm a half an hour from a stop or I'm just near the end of the ride and I just wanna get done, I'm gonna just shoot the sugar to, to be able to get to, to the next part where I can get more fuel. How much to bring? This, everybody is different. And the best way to find out what works for you is through experimentation. So when you're doing your training rides, pay attention to what you're eating on a training ride. And so for me, if I'm riding for an hour, I may not need any food and water might be enough um, or a little bit of like um, a hydration mix in my water will give me a bit of calories. But usually for an hour, I've, like, I find I don't need a ton of food. Um, if I'm doing a two hour ride, then I'll definitely need um, at least one or two bars um, or a little bit of food. If I'm doing four hour rides, that's when I wanna have like a sandwich, a bar, a gel, multiple bars, multiple gels. And again, pay attention to what you're eating on your training rides and that'll gauge um, how much you need with you. Then the last piece about nutrition to talk about tonight is eat, be eat and drink before you're hungry. Um, specifically with eating, what I find is that if I go on a ride and I don't eat, I can get through the ride, but then I get home and I just start binge eating and I go for the stuff that's like the chips and like I'll crave chicken wings and the stuff that I just don't want to eat and what because what's happened is I've depleted everything during my ride now my body is craving uh, the replenishment and so I'm craving the unhealthy stuff if I eat properly on a ride I get home and I start craving healthy food um, like fruits and vegetables and, and the stuff that I want to eat so if if you want a, a trick to help with like your overall nutrition eat while you're on the bike so you don't binge when you get home. Would it be helpful to talk about kind of what to wear on the bike in different conditions? Yeah, okay. So if, if it's hot out, it's pretty easy. You're gonna be in short sleeves. Um, for those of you who are new, new to bike shorts, there are two types of shorts, um, something called the bib short, which is 
this funny, these funny looking straps. Um, the benefit of bib shorts is that what it does is it keeps the short up, especially on your lower back. And what this helps is that as you're riding, your jersey is going to be moving. And this provides coverage for your skin, one, to keep it covered, but also prevents the abra those micro abrasions that up, add up over time and create irritation on your lower back. And once you get used to these, most people find that they never go back to like a standard cutoff short. The one issue for, especially like for women with bib straps is, well, how do you go to the washroom or you have certain anatomy that, uh, that men don't have to worry about. So a lot of, um, like there's some great products out there for women to make bib straps more comfortable. But a lot of women will choose to go with a, a cutoff short uh, because just because of those reasons, and that's perfectly good. When buying a short, number one thing is the quality of the chamois. So your chamois is inside the short, and this is going to give you your comfort. So when buying a chamois, what you're looking for is a dense foam. Sometimes chamois are very thick, but not very dense. That's going to be a lower quality chamois. Or if you squeeze it and it just feels like there's nothing there, so it's not dense, it's not thick, um, that's a lower quality chamois, then that's going to be less comfortable. When when buying shorts, you, you get what you pay for for quality of chamois. Um, so it's it's always a good investment on on a good pair of shorts. With uh, at Kind Human, one of the things we do is so we distribute our own line of custom clothing uh, by a company called Verge. So this is um, one of the shorts we made, and we um, when we when we stock our shorts in the store with our own clothing, as well as what we're selling in custom, we only offer a top of the line quality chamois because the co actual cost difference between a good chamois and a poor chamois to the manufacturer is typically only a few dollars. But what a lot of companies do is they only give the good chamois on their super expensive shorts, which make it, uh, you gotta spend a lot more money to get the good quality chamois. Or as the name Kind Human suggests, we wanna make sure people are comfortable and happy. And so we don't play that game. We just give you a really good quality chamois regardless of uh, which model short that, uh, that we're selling. So that's a little bit of plug for, for us at Kind Human. If um, like, so this time of year, uh, what do you wear when it's like 10 degrees? So um, again, like food, clothing is very personal, personable and different people run at different temperatures. So, if I kind of think of the world as like below freezing, zero to 10 degrees Celsius, 10 to 15, 15 to 20, and then kind of above 20. So below freezing as much as you can get. Um, that's usually pretty easy. Um, gloves, booties, everything you have. From zero to 10 degrees, the closer it is to, to freezing, the more you're going to want the full winter gear. When I start getting towards 10 degrees, that's when I'm getting into like, so if it's 10 degrees out, what I'll, I'll be in, I like knee warmers personally. Um, a lot of people will prefer a full leg warmer. So knee warmers or leg warmers are things you can get, you just pull them over your legs. Um, at 10 degrees, I'm still going to be in either a, a jacket. Um, so we sell both jackets as well as a long sleeve jersey. As a quick aside, the main difference between the two is a jacket will have a membrane, um, which may be windproof or waterproof, whereas a long sleeve jersey is gonna be a thicker, still jersey material, but there isn't that waterproof, windproof membrane. 10 degrees, I really like my, um, we call it the, it's called the strike, uh, long sleeve jersey. It's got a bit of a fleece lining. It's super comfortable. If it's below 10, I might wear like a long sleeve base layer below my long sleeve jersey. 
Um, if it's kind of like the 10, 12, 15 degrees, then it'll probably be a like a t-shirt length base layer that'll put under that long sleeve jersey. Uh, the other option that you get are arm warmers. Um, so again, at 10 degrees, you're going to want arm warmers. Um, and then maybe you'll have a vest to, to put over that. Um, as you start getting warmer than that, um, uh, and then sorry, uh, 10 degrees, I'm still usually wearing gloves. When I start getting to like 15 degrees is when my gloves start coming off. I may still be in my knee warmers or leg warmers and either arm warmers or my long sleeve jersey at 15. Um, again, what you got to worry about is, okay, if you're starting out in the morning and you're riding for a long ride and then by the time you get home is, you may start off at 10 degrees, but you get home and it's 25 or 20 degrees. Um, you, layers will help you to take off. So that's where like um, sleeves will come into play as opposed to a long sleeve jersey or jacket because it's hard to take your jacket off where a sleeve can go into your back pocket. Um, so kind of then when you're going, so at 15 degrees, definitely want like a vest or some kind of wind protection. Um, as I start getting between 15 and 20, the vest is starting to come off. I may still have a base layer on to give me a little bit of extra protection if it's gonna be like kind of a 15 to 20 um, out. So my base layer, I've got like a base layer underneath my jersey to give me a little extra, extra warmth. Um, and then when you're starting to get over 20 degrees, you're, you're now back into like shorts and, and t-shirts. Some people at 20 degrees may still want knee warmers and, and arm warmers or a vest um, because some people run hotter or cooler than others. So that's kind of the, uh, a very simple approach to, to clothing. The best way to figure this out is try it yourself. Uh, Linda's hand I see is raised. I have to get going, but um, whereabouts is your store? So we are on Avenue Road, uh, just south of Wilson. Okay. So the store is called Kind Human. We have the absolute best mechanic in the city. His name is Ayel. Um, and so if you have any service needs or anything, uh, our reputation is, is very, very strong for, for looking after people's bikes. Wonderful. Good. Well, you're doing a session next week as well? We are, yeah. So next week we're going to be talking about something called HRV, which is heart rate variability. And so heart rate variability is the time between each beat. So our heart rate, is, our heart is not a metronome, so it's not beating. Like if your heart rate is 60 beats per minute, you're not beating one beat per um, a beat per second. But sometimes it's shorter than a second. Sometimes it's going to be longer and more variability is better. And when you measure your heart rate, it's the number one biomarker for uh, just general fitness as well as overall well-being and, and, and health. I'm, I'm just gonna head, but thank you very much and we'll look forward to seeing you next week. Thank you very much, Linda. I appreciate all your questions. Oh, you're welcome. Have a great night. Okay, so we are, um, we're at the, I guess, the bottom of the hour. Um, I'm happy to stay on if anybody else has any other questions. Um, so I'll leave it, leave it up to you to, to what you want to do. I'm going to run, but thank, thank, you, thank so you so much for the advice. Thanks, Sarah. Mm -hmm. Thanks so much, Gavin. Thanks, Kelsey. And thanks to everybody who, who joined us. Thank you so much. Super helpful. Have a great night. Bye, everyone.